from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Communism. What is it? What strange manner of reasoning brought it about? Who are the apostles of a system that attempts to destroy the American way of life? What false hope is symbolized by the clenched fist? One hundred years ago, Karl Marx, together with Friedrich Engels, conceived a plan for a new social order. A blueprint for world revolution, based on the theory that society would reduce itself to a struggle between the rich and the poor. Eventually, the doctrine said, the workers, or proletariat, would revolt and take over industry and government. Through the first communist international, Marx spread his writings across the face of the earth. To the peasants of China, the miners of Germany, the peons of Latin America, the fast-growing cities of America. Contrary to the teaching of Marx, communism made very little headway in the highly industrialized countries where education, opportunity, and freedom were common to all. But where ignorance, poverty, and suppression dwelt, there the germ of communism found a breeding place. Russia, during the Tsarist regime, was a natural starting point. Out of this barren existence emerged a hatred of tyranny and eager disciples to put into practice the theory one man's words had put onto paper. The leaders of this revolt were Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Leon Trotsky. Their followers worked underground, planting poison at every opportune moment. They infiltrated the regular political parties, parties made up of men who worked sincerely for greater liberty and better living conditions. They built a small party machine with a hard core of fanatical, ambitious men who would be prepared to rise up and lead a revolution when the country would be most vulnerable. In 1917, the Imperial Russian Army suffered a crushing defeat by the Germans. The soldiers were stunned, hungry, demoralized, ripe for the revolution. Army morale was crumbling. In a sealed train, Lenin, who had been living in exile, quickly returned to Russia. This was the moment the extremists looked for. This was the moment for revolution. The internal situation in Russia was made to order for them. There was the great devastation caused by the German invasion. Tremendous human loss. Army morale at a breaking point. This was the moment. With only 1% of the people as members, the Communist Party began life by knifing the already stricken body of their mother country. The fires of civil war flamed. became a wasteland. 
Decisive victory came early and quickly in the November Revolution. The Bolsheviks raised their red flag of victory. Moscow became the hub of world communism. Behind its ancient turrets and spires, its bleak wall of the Kremlin, gathered traitors from countries all over the world to plan policies for subversion, sabotage, and espionage. A society for spreading world communism was formed, the Common Turn. These conspirators and turncoats banded together to forge chains to take the place of the freedoms of their homeland. The men in control were shadows, but their purpose was clear, to incite revolution the world over. To this end, they worked unceasingly through the periods of unstable peace that followed. Then came World War II. And to the amazement of the world, Moscow apparently dissolved the common term. It was declared dead, a thing of the past. Now the new party line was one of professed unity with the democratic world against the common enemy. But when the war ended, door closed again. September of 1947 saw the formation of a new coordinating body known as the Common Form, a mouthpiece for Soviet propaganda. And the shadows reappeared. They lengthened across the map of the world, blotting out the lights of freedom in every country they touched, countries blinded by false propaganda, unable to see the truth until it was too late. They ruthlessly began wiping out all opposition. In Czechoslovakia, Jan Masaryk, unwilling to trade in his lifetime democratic ideals for the tools of totalitarianism, made no compromise. He was found outside his window one day, a suicide. In Hungary, Cardinal Mindenti was placed behind bars. After a little persuasion, a la communist style, a confession came as no surprise. In Moscow, the party line dictates the way of life, a way of life foreign to our American tradition. The control of the state is placed in the clenched fist of the few. The voice of the many is silenced. The thought channels of the students in the universities are molded into a standard pattern. They are told what they must study and held to it by inflexible discipline. They do not question. The professors in the universities are not searchers after truth. They are puppets, mouthpieces for a political machine, teaching what they are told to teach, using textbooks selected by their masters. They do not question. These are not free-thinking scientists following a path of experiment and deduction regardless of where it may lead. They are skilled robots told what to think and how to work, and the nature of the conclusions they are to reach. A wedge by the party is placed in the teeth of progress. A farmer is a vassal of the state. He's forced to turn the harvest over to the government. In Russia, a man's home is not his castle. He does not have the inalienable right to own a home. He is never free of the searching eye of the secret police. In Russia, you need a permit to change your residence or to take a casual business or pleasure trip. This is not a factory of working men. It is a regiment of human machines without voice in the matter of jobs, hours, wages, or the unions of their choice. They do not question what becomes of artistic expression that must be subverted to state control?
brush out the divine spark of religion, and you have the dark, godless society of communism. The radio, communist style, is the echo of the master's voice. A free press is non-existent, and other information sources are dominated by the government. You do not get news as Americans get it. You get propaganda pellets pre-digested by Pravda. In a society where state spies check every move of the citizens and report to a central agency, how can a human being sleep at night? For non-conformists and rebels against communist doctrines, there are concentration camps. There is slavery and death. But in the United States, there is freedom. The communists can't easily infect our system of free universal education, part of the doctrine of a democratic nation. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom to learn the facts and state them in the press. Freedom to come to an independent decision and to express it at the polls. Still there are some in this country who prefer to dance to the music of the common form. Gyrations of these puppets are menacing and dangerous. In 1937, when Franklin D. Roosevelt spoke out against the tyranny of Hitler, they followed the party line, seemingly became super patriotic and supported the president. When Russia signed a non-aggression pact with Germany in 1939, and overran part of Poland and Finland while gobbling up Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, the communists suddenly turned against Roosevelt and became pro-Hitler. It is necessary to combine the strictest loyalty to the ideas of communism with the ability to make all necessary compromises, to back, to make agreements, zigzags, retreats, and so on, in order to accelerate the coming into political power. A quotation from the writings of Lenin. So, in 1941, when Hitler suddenly attacked Russia, The new patriotism was turned on again according to the party line, and they were now staunch backers of Roosevelt. Now that the hot war was ended, and the cold war has begun, the communist line is uniform and deadly. Destroy America. Democracy is an organization for the systematic use of violence by one class against another. We set ourselves the ultimate aim of destroying the state. The destruction of the state means also the destruction of democracy. One of the American communists who dances to the tune the leaders in the Kremlin play 
William Z. Foster, head of the Communist Party in the United States, has declared, when a communist heads the government of the United States, and that day will come just as surely as the sun rises, the government will not be a capitalist government, but a Soviet government. And behind this government will stand the Red Army to enforce the dictatorship of the proletariat. Eugene Dennis, general secretary of the party, who has boasted, we have involved scores of trade unions, church organizations, important sections of the democratic youth movement, as well as many farm organizations. John Gates, editor of the Daily Worker, whose pages refer to the Soviet Union as the fatherland of working people the world over. They are the open communists, the mouthpieces of the party. It is their job to pour out an endless stream of printed propaganda. To run for public office. To keep the party in the news by appearing at important congressional hearings play up the party wherever possible. They picture the police, the FBI, and other law enforcement organizations as suppressors of the masses rather than as protectors of our way of life. They attack prominent individuals as exploiters of the common man. They use the freedom granted them by American democracy to attack and belittle free American institutions. But there are other communists who don't show their real faces, who work more silently, who hide behind innocent sounding names like National Council of American Soviet Friendship, American Youth for Democracy, Congress of American Women. These front organizations with misleading names have a very definite place in the communist program. They run the gamut from pink teas and lectures to sober intellectual gatherings which attract the intelligentsia. These people give a more respectable mask to the ever-changing party line. They give money, distribute literature, spread rumors in order to exaggerate minor grievances. In many cases, the communists have been able to gain control of unsuspecting social organizations and have attempted to use them for their own purposes. Communists may join an organization unknown to the other members and take an active interest in the meetings. They come early. Hold up the usual procedure of the meeting by asking repetitious questions, finding technical flaws in anything that may come up. Until the regular members become so bored or tired that they leave and permit a communist minority to swing the voting in their own direction. By coming early and voting late, they are able to nominate sympathizers to positions of authority. With a few well-placed communists on committees and in positions of authority, the Communist Party can control a group. They can also bore from within by having knowledge of the funds and records or by planting a member on a switchboard to listen to the telephone conversations. Or by placing a mail clerk in a position to review correspondence. Or by gaining executive positions to influence plans and decisions of the organization. By gaining control of influential organizations, they first weaken the social fabric of a community, then implant communist doctrine.
The main targets of the American communists have been labor, students and teachers, government offices, all of which they attempt to corrupt by boring from within. So far, each of these agencies has done an excellent job of detecting their motives. Communist party members were removed from positions of authority in one of America's biggest unions. Other unions have followed suit in warning outside groups to leave union affairs alone. The security of the United States government demands a constant check on suspected government employees and the machinery to bring them to trial if necessary. Congressional committees maintain a constant watch over all phases of communist activity. Much of the ammunition of the communists is reserved for the armed forces. For they know that the armed forces stand guard over the frontiers of freedom. That in order to take over the country, they must first weaken the armed forces. To achieve this, their methods change with the times. Immediately after World War II, they capitalized on the natural desires of most Americans and set up a cry demanding that our boys be sent back home immediately from overseas. To excite and influence a normal desire to bring the boys home as soon as possible, girls were stationed on street corners with petitions. Buttonhole the innocent for their signatures. Then sent petitions on to Congress, not because of concern over the welfare of the men overseas, but to create discontent and confusion Mothers were encouraged to write to their sons, wives to their husbands, telling how so-and-so who was overseas no longer than they were was already home. This apparently sincere solicitude for their welfare naturally found a popular echo among the men themselves. Few of these soldiers had any idea of aiding the aims of communism, but Discontent was fanned by occasional agitators within the army who urged the men to see their commanding officers and demand to be sent home. The result was the reduction of our occupation forces before a real peace had been achieved. To this extent, the communist aim of weakening us had met with a slight measure of success. Today, as usual, Communists are still following the thumb of the party line. They stage peace parades, picket the White House, flood Congress with postcards, telegrams, and letters. All for the same purpose, pressure to cut down defense appropriations and thereby weaken the armed forces. However, just because a number of congressmen and prominent citizens may urge a cut in the military budget does not make them Reds or fellow travelers. As J. Edgar Hoover has stated, don't confuse liberals and progressives with communists. Don't label anyone as a communist unless you have the facts. In recognizing a communist, physical appearance counts for nothing. If he openly declares himself to be a communist, we take his word for it. If a person consistently reads and advocates the views expressed in a communist publication, he may be a communist. If a person supports organizations which reflect communist teachings or organizations labeled communist by the Department of Justice, she may be a communist. If a person defends the activities of communist nations while consistently attacking the domestic and foreign policy of the United States, she may be a communist. If a person does all these things over a period of time, he must be a communist. More difficult to detect are the undercover workers of communism. They can be discovered only through sharp vigilance over a long period of time. But don't call anyone a communist just because he departs from the majority viewpoint. In America, the minority's voice is heard too. Only truth and justice can defeat the ends of communism. Weakening and boring from within 
is still one of the effective tools the communists use. In the service particularly, a serviceman with his guard down may become prey in what appears to be an ordinary evening of sociability. This could be just another boy meets girl situation, a harmless evening of relaxation for the serviceman in his off-duty hours. It could be. But these girls have planned a more attractive evening than their dates have anticipated. Mixed in the dancing and beer and the casual air of the gaiety of a party, the undercurrent of the communist line held a definite place in the scheme of things. An unsuspecting serviceman, finding the girl attractive and promising, might unwittingly spread the propaganda he picked up among his buddies back at camp. But Joe's mind is not asleep, and he begins to suspect that this is something more than a social club. Air Force records revealed that Joe took these pamphlets to his commanding officer, and an investigation followed which exposed the club as a communist front hangout. In another instance, the story of a communist who used the camp newspaper to gain his own end was revealed. An attempt to damage the prestige of the army by distorting and coloring the news. Under the influence of the sergeant, the corporal blows up an ordinary grudge fight that took place between two soldiers into a story that involves the morale of the whole camp. The rest of the details are routine for the sergeant. Knowing in advance that the lieutenant in charge will kill the story because of its distortions, Collins phones a contact on a local newspaper of dubious reputation and gives him a headline that will increase its circulation. Army newspaper suppresses facts. What follows will be a poisoned account of an innocuous fight between two soldiers, plotted along communist lines into epic proportions. An attempt at undermining the army is in the making. Fortunately, many of these attempts at subversion were nipped in the bud by the watchfulness of the men themselves. But the communists don't give up easily. Their ways are varied and many. One thing at least is true of communists. They never sleep. When ships of the Navy come into harbor, they sometimes join with other sightseers. And once on board, stuff their handbills where members of the crew will find them. Some personnel have been known to receive letters from girls calling themselves pen pals. Letters that were thinly camouflaged communist propaganda. Americans will not be stampeded into seeing communists behind every door, but they will recognize and expose them when they are there by reporting to the proper officials. By doing so, they will remain true to their trust and stand vigilant against those who endeavor to uproot America's birthright of freedom and democracy. Freedom-loving peoples all over the world stand alert to the menace of communism. In Europe, in Asia, in the Americas, They are uniting in defense of individual rights for men and individual sovereignty for nations. The United States will lead in this defense, for we know the value of freedom in terms of freedom of worship, enlightenment of the mind, the right to learn the true values of life undistorted. the right to freely chosen representation in the law-making processes. 
the right to freedom of speech without fear of oppression by state police, the right to move from place to place at will. America has not forgotten the lessons of the past, nor the voices of her founders. Freedom-loving people all over the world have sworn eternal hostility toward any form of tyranny over the mind of man. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.